Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Crazy Tech Reviews. And in today's video we're going to be taking a look at a brand new product called the Blue Scuzzy. Now, what is the Blue Scuzzy? Well, in order to answer that question, I'd like to show you guys this. This here is a dead Quantum Pro Drive LPS hard drive that is a pretty common example of something you would find inside of a vintage Mac. This particular model is a 20 megabyte hard drive, and uh, the issue is, is that these are starting to become really hard to find, and especially in working condition. As a matter of fact, every single one of these hard drives that I have, and as well as many other SCSI hard drives uh, for these vintage Macs, are starting to die recently. And uh, the main reason is because they're 30 years old, and uh, they're just wearing down with age and everything. And uh, that's what where the blue SCSI comes in. So for a while, there have been products that allow you to remedy uh, this issue, like the SCSI to SD, for example, which basically converts the SCSI interface used on several of these old hard drives into a modern SD card interface, allowing you to use a nice, secure, and reliable form of data in, in the place that this vintage hard drive would typically serve. This also has several other benefits, allowing you to easily put data onto your machine and several other things. However, the issue is, is that the SCSI to SDs typically run as much as these old hard drives, if not even more in some cases. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at a brand new solution to this issue that's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to use than the SCSI to SD. And uh, that product is the Blue SCSI. So with that said, let's go ahead and cut open this envelope, take a look at this product, and see how it works. Anyway, I figured I'd also go ahead and mention that if you are new to the channel, be sure to click the subscribe button and the like button on this video. It helps me out a lot. And uh, um, the channel has been growing a lot recently and uh, you guys subscribing is what helps me keep uh, putting out these videos. So uh, I really appreciate if you're new here that if you go ahead and quickly click the subscribe button. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get right into this review. I'd also like to mention real quick that um, this review by no means is sponsored by the Blue Scuzzy development people or anything like that. This is all my own personal opinion. So this is not being diluted by anybody else's uh, vision. So. Um, yeah, uh, just keep that in mind when watching this. This is all my personal opinion, uh, nobody else's. And, uh, yeah, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get right into this video. So the first thing I figured I'd do is show you guys where you can buy the Blue SCSI. If you go to the website SCSI.blue, this is the official Blue SCSI website. Looking over here, you'll see, um, all the people who make the Blue SCSI units. And you can also see, uh, whether or not they're in stock or not for the, each particular person. You can also build your own custom blue SCSI unit, as this is technically an open source project. Um, you can download the PCB files and uh, pretty much everything you need to build your own off this uh, single GitHub uh, page here, and uh, pretty much buy all the parts that you need to build your own. However, even though pretty much all the resources you need to build your own blue SCSI are available uh, for f use, um, you need to keep in mind that the blue SCSI name is trademarked, and also the PCB designs are under a non-commercial use, meaning you can, te you can technically build and assemble your own blue SCSI units for yourself or for friends. However, you can't just start printing or building out the blue SCSIs and selling them on your own without the permission of the blue SCSIs developers. So uh, keep this in mind, uh, it's not 100% free to just go and build and start selling your own units as obviously that would hurt their business, so don't do that. However, most of you guys are probably going to be more interested in directly buying uh, a pre-assembled or a blue SCSI kit directly from one of the people who um, supply them. You can also find links to three of the suppliers of the Blue SCSI, two for America and Canada and one for Europe, and uh, this will take you to a separate page where, where you can purchase um, either a kit or a pre-assembled unit if uh, they're in stock at that given time. Anyway, uh, with that all out of the way, it's time to go ahead and uh, crack open this uh, envelope and see what's inside. I do really appreciate the touch of the blue envelope. However, for some reason my scissors were just dull today, so I decided I'd end up going back and grabbing this knife and just cutting it open that way. Either way, um, I got it open somehow, and uh, inside we have the blue scuzzy kit itself, as well as a nifty little uh, note that we'll get to in a second. So this is basically just a little uh, paper uh, note that explains how to set up and use your blue SCSI, and this comes with uh, any blue SCSI you order. Um, and uh, I have to just really appreciate the fact that this thing was written in Claris Works 3 on a Mac SC30 and printed on an image writer 2 with tractor feed paper. It's just so cool, and they sure know their audience well. Anyway, I also have to thank uh, Tom a lot for the special little handwritten message. It's things like this that make doing YouTube just that much more enjoyable. Okay, so we're up here in my new uh, little soldering bench thing here that I set up. 
And uh, I have the kit here that I ordered. Uh, now, if I haven't mentioned already, uh, basically how this works is you can buy a kit or you can buy the finished pre-assembled model. Now, the pre-assembled one typically costs around 50 bucks or so. Um, however, I bought the cheaper of the two, which is the one you have to assemble yourself, and this only costs 25 bucks. So compared to paying uh, 90 for uh, some of the alternative um, <clears throat> uh, hard drive replacement options, you can get this for only 25 bucks, so it's definitely a big deal. Um, however, we'll have to hope that I can assemble it correctly. So, first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is take this out of the little uh, anti-static bag here, which it comes in, which is pretty nice. And uh, as you can see here, um, we have all the parts for this. So really, it's not that many parts to assemble. Uh, the first thing we have here is the optional 3D printed case. Now, I actually wasn't aware that I was going to get one of these, but um, Tom, who is one of the people who assembles these, I guess, uh, decided to ship one in uh, my way. So if you're watching this right now, thanks. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, I will definitely be putting this to good use since I have a Macintosh LLC, which is the machine that I'm going to be using this in. So thanks a lot for the 3D printed case. I really appreciate it. Anyway, the next thing we have here is the PCB for the Blue Scuzzy. As you can see here, um, it happens to be blue, which is really cool. I like how everything about this comes in blue packaging. Um, it's really awesome. Um, so they definitely did a lot of attention to detail when it comes to this. So yeah, this PCB is very high quality, um, from what I could tell. Um, looks really nice and uh, really cool. Looking here, you can see we have the parts uh, that you build this out of. We have a few resistor packs, you know, your SCSI connector, various other things. Uh, and then this. Now, if you're wondering why it's called a blue SCSI, it's because of this device here. This is a Blue Pill Arduino based microcontroller, from what I understand. And this is sort of what runs the whole operation. This mounts directly to this PCB here and uh, is what basically manages everything. And so, yeah, uh, that's that. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and fire up the soldering iron. Um, I have my printed out instructions here. I just printed out the GitHub page. And uh, let's hope that this thing, uh, we assemble this thing nice and smoothly and don't break anything because that would really suck. So yeah, let's go ahead and get right into this. So let's go ahead and start the Blue Scuzzy assembly process. The first thing I'm going to go ahead and install onto the board is the SD card slot. Now, this part here is probably the most difficult part to install, so I wanted to just get it over with when there was nothing else in the board to get in my way. This part is the only surface mount part, though, that you will have to install on this board. Uh, I struggled with this for a bit, uh, but eventually, I, after putting some flux down on the PCB, I was able to uh, get the board to where most of the pins didn't bridge, which is the issue I had earlier. And then after that, I fixed any bridging pins with uh, some solder wick and uh, also went ahead and cleaned up the remaining flux that was on the PCB and uh, I just scrubbed it down with a q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol to do that and then I checked with the multimeter to make sure that the uh, pins were not bridging at all and fortunately none of them were. Anyway I'll go ahead and uh, solder on all the uh, grounding points now. The main purpose of these is for structural integrity since the jack does experience a lot of mechanical stress from inserting and removing SD cards and so it's important that you solder all of these and they also of course function as a ground for the shield of the SD card slot. Anyway I'll go ahead and clean off the rest of the residue that was left by soldering those. And uh, next I'll go ahead and install these two diodes here. Uh, I'll go ahead and snip off the little uh, paper things that are holding them together and I'll go ahead and bend the leads so that we can insert them into the PCB and uh, then once they are uh, flush uh, on the PCB as far as they will go I'll go ahead and spread out the leads. I heard complaints earlier in the process of the development of this that there, uh, the uh, lead spacing between the two diodes and the PCB was a little bit too short but apparently that's been fixed since then. And although all the diodes are in place I'll go ahead and apply some fresh solder to each of the four pins that hold both of the diodes onto the PCB. And then I'll go ahead and uh, bend these pins back up and snip them off with scissors in this case. Honestly, I would have used something like some flush cutters to do this, however, I was too lazy to grab mine, so I just used scissors. I ended up coming back with some flush cutters or a similar type of tool and trimming these back a bit more. Anyway, the next step in this process is to go ahead and install the Blue Pill microcontroller. Now basically how this installs into the board is fairly simple. There's uh, two uh, headers here that you will put into the board to where the insulating piece is on the top side of the board, the same side the SD card slot is on. 
and then you can go ahead and solder these two into the main PCB. I chose to solder the longer legs on the bottom, the sides that you would usually plug whatever you want into it. Uh, and the main reason I did this is because uh, that way I don't have to worry about damaging the microcontroller when I trim the legs down. And then the microcontroller should sit on top just like so, on top of the insulating rubber p or plastic pieces on the top side of the PCB to where the USB port is facing the same direction as the SD card. And then of course you can come back and solder all of these pins. One suggestion I do have for the Blue Scuzzy development team is that if, um, or instead of just including uh, a generic pin header in the kit to uh, directly solder the microcontroller to the PCB, I feel like it would be a better idea to make it to where the microcontroller can slot in and out of the PCB. So for example, if the microcontroller gets uh, fried or if you want to upgrade the microcontroller to a newer version, if that's something that exists, um, I feel like that would make it a lot of an easy a lot easier of a process instead of directly just soldering it in like this. Now, obviously, you can do this with your own if you want to. However, I feel like it would be a good idea moving on in future versions if, you know, that could be included directly with the kit. I mean, it wouldn't cost too much extra, and it would be a really nice uh, feature to have in the event that somehow you damage the actual microcontroller itself. So, uh, just something I'd like to uh, point out there, and let's get back to the assembly process. So the next thing we're going to install are the four resistor packs. Now these are pretty easy to install, basically there's a little gray dot on uh, the left side of each resistor pack, and uh, each of these dots need to be on the uh, outer edge of the microcontroller. That means that if the front of these is the label, the left ones will be facing forward towards you, and the right ones will be facing backwards towards the microcontroller, and the dots will be on these sides of it. Anyway, something else I need to mention is that um, these are there are actually two separate values here. The back ones are 220 of, uh, I'm not sure the exact unit, but uh, the front ones here are 330. Now you can identify these because they're, it's written both on the resistor packs themselves and also on the PCB, so you can know exactly where to put these down. However, it's pretty easy to install those. So, uh, keeping that all in mind, I went ahead and started to install all the resistor packs. These are pretty easy to install, I basically just tacked down one page pin on the end and then come back with the solder and solder and the rest of it and then repeat the same process for the other four of them. And overall, this wasn't too complicated to install, and the instructions explain it pretty well. I also went ahead and installed this SCSI connector. This is also pretty simple. You basically just match it up with the silk screen and then solder in all the pins. And unfortunately, I lost the clip of me soldering all the pins in, but here you can see the finished product and all the solder joints in the back. So the next thing you're going to want to install are the SCSI termination jumpers. Now, these are pretty easy to install. Uh, basically, uh, you just need to make sure that they run parallel to the... Um, uh, resistor packs here and you're basically good to go. Unfortunately, I lost the footage of uh, installing these, but the process is pretty simple if you've ever installed a jumper before. At this point, the only components left to install are this uh, header here, which is optional, and also the optional bird connector here on the side if you want external power to the blue SCSI and it doesn't receive enough power from the built-in SCSI connection, but those are not required. Anyway, now that my Blue Scuzz unit is fully assembled, the first thing I want to do is go ahead and uh, plug the device in and make sure it's working properly. Sometimes issues can happen during the assembly process that you may only notice once it's fully assembled, so it's important to test it out ahead of time. I'm just going to go ahead and plug in the micro USB power right to the microcontroller, and as you can see, there's these few lights in the top of the microcontroller that light up. This first one over here on the left is the power LED, and it's pretty obvious what this does, it just indicates whether or not the power is on. However, there's also this LED right here, and if we take a look at the Blue Scuzzy PCB, this is labeled as the PC13 LED. However, this LED is really important in the matter of the Blue Scuzzy device itself, as this LED is used to indicate any possible issues or what the Blue Scuzzy device is actually doing. In my particular case, the LED flashed five times when I plugged into power, which according to the GitHub repository indicates that the SD card Card cannot be found or located. Now, this was a good sign to me as it meant the device was able to successfully power up and determine that there is no SD card installed. Um, however, we won't know entirely for sure if the device is working until I'm actually able to put in an SD card and plug it into a real vintage Mac and try it out that way. Which brings us to the next issue, and that's actually finding an SD card to go into this device. I have quite a few standard SD cards laying around here in this bin, as well as various other types of flash media. However, this device uses micro SD cards, and I don't currently have any of those laying around here that aren't already being used in something. I could go out and just buy one, however. I just decided I'd steal one from my Raspberry Pi 2 that I haven't used in a while and back it up and wipe it. The actual SD card configuration and formatting for this device is very simple, especially compared to something like the SCSI to SD 
SSD's formatting and configuration process. This is mainly because the Blue SCSI uses a standard HDA hard disk images compared to just raw binary data on the SD card. All you really have to do is plug in the micro SD card into your computer. In this case, I'm using a special adapter since my laptop doesn't have a dedicated micro USB port on it and format the card as XFAT or FAT32. And then uh, download one of the pre-made hard drive images off the Blue SCSI GitHub repository or make your own. However, I won't get into the image creation process here as it's pretty complicated and I haven't mastered it myself yet, so I don't really feel like I'm qualified to talk about that. Anyway, once you have your hard disk image ready, uh, you'll need to drag it over onto the SD card volume, and now comes the slightly difficult part. In order for the microcontroller on the Blue SCSI to know what to do with the hard disk image, you'll need to rename it to something different. The general naming scheme for the Blue SCSI is HDXY underscore 512.hda, the X representing the SCSI ID, which can be anywhere from 0 to 7, and Y represents the SCSI uh, LUN or logic unit number. This can be either 1 or 0, and the 512 on the end represents the sector size. This can also be changed to 256 or 1024. In most cases though, you should be fine leaving the name as HD10 underscore 512.hda. However, this may or may not change depending on if you're using multiple volumes or require any special functionality from the device. More info on this can all be found in the GitHub page linked below in the description. Anyway, once you're done with that, you should be good to go ahead and eject the SD card and insert it into the blue SCSI and plug it into your machine. For most of this video, I'll be using my original Macintosh LC with 10 megs of RAM for testing. However, I'll try it on some other systems later on in this video. Since the pre-included images from the GitHub repository aren't bootable, I'll be booting the system off the System 7 floppy disk. And sure enough, when we boot to the desktop, you can see the hard drive image was initialized and ready to go. The first thing I'm going to do is copy the system folder from this disk onto the hard drive, and I know this isn't a proper install of System 7, but it's enough to at least use the thing and see how well it performs. After ejecting the floppy, I'll go ahead and restart the machine, and holy crap, this thing is pretty fast by comparison. As a matter of fact, the time between when the hard drive st first starts being read and when the system is fully loaded is only about 11 seconds. And what I mean by that is, is I'm essentially going to, for all these comparisons, cut off the initial uh, process that the machine does before it starts reading from the hard drive as different machines with different RAM configurations from different time periods might uh, cause a bit too much variability in this and we're only trying to judge the performance of the Blue SCSI device itself. So that's why I'm doing that. Anyway, uh, as I promised I would, I also went ahead and plugged in the Mac this device to the Macintosh SE FDHD I have, and as you can see, um, I also used a slightly different uh, System 7.0.1 installation that was more optimized for the SE versus the LC. And um, as you can see, it takes slightly longer to boot up the SE, taking 25 seconds, but it still boots up pretty quickly, and it's definitely much better than using an original hard drive or only floppy disks. And while we're at it, I figured I'd also try to answer how the Blue SCSI compares to something like the SCSI to SD as far as a speed perspective goes. And that's a really difficult thing to judge, as for one, there are several different versions and models of the SCSI to SD, each running at different speeds with different levels of performance. However, from what I understand, and from benchmarks other people have done on this device, since I don't have uh, any SCSI SD devices to benchmark myself, the Blue SCSI has a max read speed of 1181 kilobits per second, and a max write speed of 664 kilobits per second. This means that the Blue SCSI will outperform the SCSI to SD version 5, which only has a max read speed of 523 kilobits per second and a max write speed of 267 kilobits per second. However, it still lags behind the version 6. So compared to the two models, it runs right in the middle, and if I'm going to be completely honest, speed probably isn't even the biggest concern when it comes to this device, as the amount of money you're saving for something that's maybe just a little bit slower than the flagship SCSI SD version 6 model makes it completely worth buying in my opinion regarding the performance of the device. And also, I just want to make it clear, while it might sound like it, I'm not trying to rail on the SCSI to SD. Uh, it's mainly just the fact that it is uh, one of the more popular and well-known products in this particular niche and is one that the Blue SCSI competes with pretty well. So I figure it's good that I sort of uh, compare this device to the uh, SCSI to SD and 
um, that means pointing out some of the downsides of the SCSI SD as compared to this. So I'm not trying to rail on the SCSI SD, it's still a good product, but um, I'm just trying to sort of give you a comparison so that you know what to buy here. Something else that I feel is important to talk about here is the device's compatibility regarding different vintage Macs. For one, the device is basically tried and true on most common and well-known 68K systems. It's tested and guaranteed to work on the SE, SE30, all of the classic systems, including the Color Classic. All the Mac 2 systems, however, the external power is required with, for use with uh, 2CI. All the original LC Pizza Box systems, as well as the LC 475, and also the 575. And most likely will run on most of the systems based off the 68K line of processors. So if you do try it on any system that isn't already in this list, be sure to message the Blue SCSI developers and community about it so that it can be added to the list. On the opposite side, the device is known to have issues with systems like the Macintosh Plus and some PowerPC. C machines, so you will have to try it on these at your own risk. However, the Blue SCSI community and team are constantly working to increase compatibility with these systems, so most likely some of these systems will gain full compatibility with the Blue SCSI in the near future. I already know for sure that they are working on making the device run better with the Plus. So honestly, on the topic of compatibility, even though it still has a large hole in the list of known compatible machines, it's really hard to complain uh, as the device is only a few months old and evolving and developing all the time and it still currently supports a large amount of the common machines people are getting into these days. So for, for most people, this won't be a significant problem. So uh, what do I think of the Blue SCSI and would I recommend it to you? Well, as with any product or any solution to any issue, it really depends on what you're planning on doing with it and what your use case is. For most cases where you just want to simply uh, have a modern uh, hard drive solution that's easy to use and uh, reliable for your vintage Macs, uh, I would 100% say go with the Blue SCSI. It's a great little device for that and it works really well. And it isn't too slow as well. It has pretty competitive speeds. Um, however, at the same time, if you really do need some of the advanced features of the SCSI to SD or you really do need that speed, then obviously I would suggest just spending the extra money and going with the SCSI to SD. However, at the same time, the Blue SCSI is evolving really fast and it's uh, only been on the market for a few months now, so it's definitely growing a lot and it will definitely have a lot of new features added on in the future. So uh, maybe if you are waiting for some of those more advanced features and functionality, it might be a good idea to just wait for the Blue SCSI. Um, just wait a bit longer and see if the Blue SCSI adds that. However. Um, there's multiple options for multiple reasons, and honestly, I feel like for most people, um, the Blue SCSI will definitely suffice as far as a hard drive replacement. So, uh, for that, I 100% recommend the Blue SCSI, um, in, in that particular use case. Anyway, um, also, I'll go ahead and leave a link to the Blue SCSI store and the GitHub page down in the description in case anybody is interested in possibly picking one of these up or learning more about it. And uh, also, thanks. A, I want to give a massive thanks to uh, the Blue SCSI developers and the Blue SCSI community for uh, providing all the help they did with the production of this video and uh, providing me with all the information I need to know about this device and about um, uh, just how to use it and everything like that. And uh, they're great people. So uh, yeah, um, thanks a lot for doing that uh, if any of you guys are watching this video. Anyway, um, you might notice that the workbench here is a little bit of a disaster over on this side, and that's because I'm actually working on an upcoming project. I'm not sure if it will be the next video on the channel, but it's certainly in progress, and that is um, a video on restoring uh, several of these old uh, portable FM AM radios. Now, this one here is made by Sony, and it's kind of disassembled. The top is missing from it right now, but... Um, I also have these two units here from uh, Sanyo in this case, and this is actually I think my favorite of all three. Uh, it's this nice little compact uh, AM FM radio here. And uh, I also have this unit here from Panasonic. And uh, these two I haven't started working on yet, but uh, this one I have. So uh, these are all pretty dusty and grimy, so I'm planning on just cleaning them up and I'm pretty sure they work. I don't see what would possibly go wrong with them, but I haven't tried them out 100% yet. So. Uh, we will be doing, or I will be doing a video in the future where you will see these getting all cleaned up. But um, another thing I want to mention too is um, the uh, Macintosh SE and the 2C. Um, 
As you remember, I did restoration videos for those a while back. The SE one is actually currently privated because of some issues I had with it, so I'm I'm trying to get that those resolved so I can put it back out. But um, anyway, uh, basically, uh, you might have remembered I did restoration videos on both the SE and the 2C, and um, those technically aren't complete yet. And the reason is is because I plan to retrowrite both of those systems. I know I've been teasing it for a while. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I promise I will be doing it sometime this summer or very shortly. Um, uh, the only issue is I really just need to get the chemicals and the time to do that. But you sh you may be seeing uh, future parts to both of those restoration projects sometime in the near future. And along with that, I have several other planned videos. Um, I might be doing um, the uh, thrifting one even sooner than I thought, as a lot of the COVID restrictions are raised or are uh, being lifted around my area. So um, I might be able to start going out a bit more to uh, do those thr thrifting videos. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, with that said, there's a lot of stuff coming in the future, so if you are new here, be sure to subscribe, and um, hopefully if you've already been around here, there's a lot of exciting stuff to look forward to. But anyway, with that said, that basically is everything for today's video, so uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys all next time.